Hello, chess friends. <clears throat> this is International Master Valeria Leof talking from year 2087. Yes, this is why my voice is like that, and I'm an old man already. Now, I'm not. I'm just sick. Well, I hope I'm not sick. Anyway, I hope you can cope up with me because my voice is a little bit of sore. And anyway, today we're going to be talking about a very, very exciting topic. I'm going to be talking to you about the secrets of positional chess. And more importantly, I'm going to be talking to you about how you can take those secrets and put them right in your game. You know, uh, yesterday I had a very interesting conversation with my dad. I mean, my dad was, and he, he always will be, the only trainer I ever had. He is a chess master. I mean, candidate of a master, so to speak. Um, and one of the things that he ever taught me as most important is that, you know, knowledge does not equal skill. Skill, however, equals mastery. And so I think that disconnect of how do we actually develop a skill is the reason why most chess players do not improve their game the way they want it. So really what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and explain what are the secrets of making your you know improvement count how do you do that and more importantly what is the major what are the major principles so we're going to see that and we're also going to see how masters use them beautifully in their own games so let us begin with a fantastic game i'm going to pick it up right now and i'm going to show it to you uh, that was played between uh, Tigran Vartanovic Petrosian. Now, Tigran Petrosian, two Tigran Petrosians, I'm talking about the world champion, the ex world champion. He was one of the toughest chess players ever. He lived in the uh, in Soviet Union um, in a very tough era, like where almost every strong grandmaster was in his prime. So that was a very, very tough era to be a champion. And one of the things that I uh, like so much love about looking at his games is his solidity. So that was something really brilliant. Now, let's begin with the game that was played by Petrosian himself. I'm going to open up the game and then we start. So, okay, one second. Here we go. But his game was played from Tigran Petrosian as black. He was actually playing with the black pieces, and uh, basically the way it went. Uh, I want to. I want to. By the way, I want to know. Do you guys hear me? Is there any sound coming through? I want to know if um, I know that my voice is like that. But as long as you can cope with me, I'd like to know: Is there any sound coming through? Okay, so, um, do you guys hear me? Is it okay? Is it not okay? It's all good. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, in this game, Petrojan was playing with the black pieces. White played knight of three. So black did g6, d4, and bishop g7. Now, we're not going to talk so much about, you know, like openings and everything. But basically, I have the bishop g7, c4, and d6. You can see what it's all about. Basically, black got the chance to play e5. And after e4, he plays knight c6. <clears throat> I mean, what is this all about? This is the king's Indian. The most important thing in an opening is for you to know what it is all about. If you don't know what it's all about, then you've lost it along the way. Now, the real key of black in playing this opening is the chance to push and try to force white to advance and block in the center. Now, is that everything? Well, more, more or less, yes. It's a good start. Now, after the move of knight of the c6, white plays d dix to the e5, Knight x to the e5 and knight of the d4. It helped him to get uh, an extra control around the middle, as well as the possibility of playing bishop b2 and short castle. Now, after the move of knight of the d4, black has to do something. 
Now I'd like to know what you guys think. What should black do now? <clears throat> this is a great question. And I'd like to know what you've got to say about this here. So, should Black do anything? What should Black do? Anyone? Do you guys have any suggestions? Now, simply not of six, develop. I agree. Knight of six makes sense. We can do that because that would eventually help out to solidify the position. Why not? It's, it's okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to say something important here. See, Petrosian was a great master of the buildup. One of the things that you'll find out in most of his games is how brilliantly he got the chance to build up the position, a position, and then play with it versus the opponent. What we see here is the move of a6. And that was the move that you wanted to do. And the reason why that move works out so well is because what's going to happen here is <clears throat> just taking away the opponent's great opportunity to move in. He does not get to have the chance to play with a move of knight of the b5. And as there is no practical way to do this, you can see that what the black is getting ready to plan for knight of six and a couple of similar moves just like that. See, we're not talking here about is this good or is this bad? Not at all. We're talking simply of a variation that will help black to take the position, take the control of this position and bring it to the next level. It's a beautiful, great looking move in a sequence that works. This is it. This is what that line is all about. Now, <clears throat> is there more to that? Yes, there is. So, um, like, okay, let's, after that move really happened, after this went on, it's going to be interesting to just to see what really, what really happened, what really came through. So, after that move, uh, as it came, as, I mean, after A6, then, um, obviously, white had to do something, so you played with bishop b2, and black plays c5. You have no idea how underestimated the buildup of an opening structure is. In the opening, everything is about that. If you don't get the right structure, you get killed. And it's kind of interesting to really point that out, because this is really the big thing. This is the, the one the one idea that's, that stands, I'd say, in the in the base, in the essence of most of these, most of the tactics. If you don't do that, you don't get to have a, an advantage. It's a brilliant concept that seems to work. Now, of course, we ask ourselves, how is this going to work? I mean, what if White just moves his knight out of the way? Well, he did. White did move his knight out of the way. And Black continued with bishop e6. Now, remember another very important idea. Every pawn move in an opening is supposed to help the overall development of the pieces. Now, that means if you have a move that for whatever reason does not do that, for whatever reason that move, that one move you're thinking about, is not going to help your development in the way you want to help it, most likely you should not be playing that one move. See, it's a very simple rule, but it's very important to remember that. You see, that the secret is to make sure that every move by itself counts in respect to the development that we're going to get. The development that we're going to get is the big deal. And so, hence why Black just did those couple moves, because he knows, he knows that his development matters. Now, there's a lot more to that, so don't, 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 let's not stop here. So Bishop E6 did him come out, apparently a very good looking move, <clears throat> very solid looking move. And uh, 
Yeah. With that in mind, of course, white played knight d5. And this is going to be an important question for me to ask you because I know how necessary it is to answer it. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you very carefully. Now, black has to choose how to go about this knight. He can exchange it. He can move against it or he can do something completely different. I don't know. Okay. This is the big question. My question to you be, what should black do against white's knight on d5? What should be his best response to that knight? <laughs> Let's see if anybody has an idea. Please, 97. Okay. Now, what's happening to my voice? Uh, I am I'm talking from the future. And I'm an old man. So, not e7. Can we do that? Nope, we don't want to do that. What we want is to exchange the knight. See, knight, bishop takes the d5 is the right way to go. Because the reality is that if we don't do this move, likely we're not going to get the possibility that we need to challenge. Now, the first rule of such positions, the very first rule is do not leave your opponent with any great possibility, with any, with any strong possibilities or resources. Now this move, what it will do is that it's going to force him to move back. And then, of course, we're going to be successful. Bishop takes the E, takes the Now what? Of course, we just develop. We don't want anything else. We just want to finish up with our development. That's what Black wanted. And he kind of got it. So there it is. Develop. Develop, develop. Great move. So, <clears throat> now, after the move of knight e7, apparently, White's got a little bit of worry about, so he doesn't have that many things to do. So, he actually did not like the position he castles. Black castles too. And then White plays the move of rook to b1. And this is a pretty good position. I gotta say, this is a really, really nice position to talk about. So, what should Black do? It's a wonderful situation to plan, and I'd like you to tell me. <clears throat> so we chopped off the knight. We did that well. I agree. I got. I got to tell. I got to give you that. We chopped off the knight. And it was great. But now what? B five possible. Yes, it is because we're just going to we're going to attack him there, and we're going to get an opportunity. Mm, why not? We would love this, <laughs> but not enough. You see, I would love that kind of candidate if it wasn't for the white, a bit simple chance to recapture, take down the knight. You see, it's not so much that the move is bad, okay? I don't hate the move. I think that it's okay. The problem of the move is that it's just not going to work, not in the way we want it to work, not in that direction. So we need a different possibility. Something else needs to happen. question is what? What else do we need to do? Hmm. See, <clears throat> this is a huge position to discuss because I think that in uh, in one way or another, there's a great decision to be made. From that night that we see on E5 and a couple of the pieces that look so good on their own, something really important must occur because those pieces are just so important and so very valuable that <clears throat> whatever we do with them has to count. It has to matter. We don't know how or in what way this will count or matter, but it has to. We just need to to find a way and make it work. How? Anyone? Queen a5, knight c8. Okay, what did Petrosian do? First rule of middle game. Do not jump. That means do not break through into attacking. 
defending or doing anything special. Not yet. Not right now. If you jump, you will be in trouble. That's one of the rules. The rule also, one of the biggest rules, you know, suggests that any jump we do is likely going to end in a very painful way because we're not ready, okay? We are not ready yet. So the biggest problem that many chess players experience within similar positions is that they don't realize when you finish up the opening, you are at your baby stage of basically just making yourself strong. That means you're not at even, even half ready to take up your position and turn it into something uh, you know, more powerful, more dangerous yet. We're not ready, not even one bit. So how do we do that then? How do we, what do we do in this case? If we're not ready, if we're behind, if we're just backward and everything is like not so good, what's to do? <clears throat> that is a great question. I love that question. Well, the first thing that I reckon, thing that we need to do, I, I gather, <clears throat> is that we must start by gradually setting out our pieces on more advanced positions. Now, see, this is, it's not just me telling you, hey, there it is. This is the thing. This is the rule. Do that. Not at all. Not at all. What I'm telling you, however, is that it is very important that you go on with an improvement, and I'm talking about a way for you to just take some of your pieces up and make them better in one or two moves. That's what Black does with 9 to 5. Not about attacking, but about getting the opponent in a situation where he feels inferior and is given the opportunity to break through or open, which is going to make it even more difficult for him, just like what White did. Most chess players do not realize that the secret, one of the biggest secrets of positional play is the ability to let the opponent begin first. My dad used to call it, give him the brush so he can start painting bullshit on the board. I love that expression. He used to say it so many times. I love saying that too. Give him the chance to move first, attack first, or do whatever. And now with the move queen to c7, bishop b2, and rook f e8, black is definitely much better in this position. Now you're probably wondering, why did white have to make the weakness? Because people make mistakes. See, there is no perfect game. Everybody more or less makes a mistake. When they do, it is your job to punish him. It is your job to prove him wrong and to basically take the opportunity into your own hands. So now what we realize at this point is the huge and almost impossible to defend different position that he's going to get into as the game progresses. Now that's a very interesting moment. It's a very interesting moment. After White played 94, I'd like to know what you guys will do right now after 94. What do you think Black should do? This is interesting. Very intriguing. Why not b5? What about the backward pawn on the d6? I think that, uh, you know, we can do these, especially b5. But b5 is too risky. d6 is well defended. So I don't I don't mind it, but we get to realize that the problem. I mean, so the b7 pawn is going to be much more of a worse place piece. And then we've got other issues. I think that Black simply needs to decide what to do now. You see, this is just, I think this is the, the sort of most important thing he needs to discover at this point. What to do now? Thing. This is a big question. What to do now? Hmm. <clears throat> okay, now let's see what you guys have to say. Um, I Queen C6, okay, I need some meaning behind the moves. So I don't want to just you to just 
you know, spit out a move that you have in your, on your mind, but rather just tell me why you would do it. Truth be told, after the move of knight d4, black plays knight takes d, bishop takes d, and then knight d7. <clears throat> that was it. Now, why are we doing this kind of sequence here? The reason why that works so very well is because black is now set out for a move of knight to c5. And we also realize that as old black goes this way, if the knight really arrives at the c5, we're just going to have a fairly strong set of pieces and challenges against the opponent. So this is a great move. So white plays bishop e3. What do we do now? And so we try to keep him on the backside. And white's obviously trying to give his best to stay away from trouble. So that's nice. Mm -hmm. We must discover a stronger possibility, another way to get things going. Now, we don't know how, but that must appear in the next moves. So what's the best resource? I want you to look further. Think about this very carefully. What's Black's best way to go here? Now, there's, there's lots of moves, you know. Now, I want to tell you that. There's lots of moves. There's, uh, you know, that and this move, and then that move, and then that move, and then that move. That's, that's a lot. A lot of moves. Now, let me put it this way. The most important thing that you need to do in a position of this kind, the, most, the single most important thing that you need to do in a position of this kind, is to try and stay away. Now you may ask, okay, stay away from what? Try and stay away from ordinary moves. Now this will sound crazy to someone who's like, okay, Valeria, what the hell are you talking about? Ordinary moves basically means moves with which you set, simply set up to do something interesting, and yet the move does not pose any problems to the opponent. It does not cause any real danger. So basically, he just says, okay, well, that's fine. I don't have to worry myself. I can just do this, and it's going to be great. And likelihood, that's true. They can do that, and they will be okay, and they'll be all right. Now the position is going to feel fine all the way. The secret, and this is really, really important, the secret in these kinds of positions <clears throat> almost always stands out to be in the way, or as I like to call it, the possibility to attack. So any sorts of checks, captures, direct threats, forcing moves that we've got in get against the opponent in our position. Any of those type of ideas are always more important to look for or think about as opposed to some others. So now what we have after the move of bishop to the e3 is a very simple move. It's rook takes to the e3. So after we have that rook takes to the e3 and then we have f takes to the e3, then there is the move of knight to c5. And so what we could just get to see is that uh, of the knight of the c5, then we can have a move like rook to the e8. Uh, we can have queen to the e7 as an opportunity. There is plenty of really good moves and really powerful ideas that will help black speeders to come together and challenge. And that is... It's not just a nice looking idea. That is literally the best order on how black is going to set out his pieces. Not just because of the pressure and tension we can make against the E3. I mean, that matters. It's because of every important piece that is now involved. Now, remember the rule. And the rule always turns out to be the same. If you want to succeed you want to be thinking about restriction. Now, I often say that there are three kinds of moves you care about most in chess. We have the forcing moves, checks, captures, direct threats. Then we have the restrictive, and then we have the reinforcing. But that's a little bit untrue, okay? Because the reality is that every move you got to do must punch 
him. Maybe not in the face, maybe in the chest, maybe in the, you know, in the head. And not literally. I mean, figuratively. You got to make him worry. Now, can we always make him worry? Not directly, but you can indirectly make him worry by posing more problems and more difficulties or more issues or more, uh, I think you get an idea of what I'm trying to say here. A lot more of those that will constantly remind him about the difficulties of his position and how it's hard to play it. So the secret really comes down not so much to uh, is this move good or is it bad? And that's easy. But it comes down to figuring out this, the, you know, the little ideas that we care about most, the, the things that are necessary in a specific position. Looking here, we realize that why it's an exchange up and nobody cares. Because the reality is that with that pawn on the E3 and our ability to challenge against it, there's going to be more than difficult, just more than just a big difficulty for him to, to hold that. So uh, this is very, very important. Okay, now that's very interesting. Okay, and so um, after that, that's kind of a move in this type of position. And um, so, you know, we have that move of knight c5, white played queen c2, and we do rook e8 in this type of position. And then after that, rook to the 8 white plays rook to f3, and then bishop h6. This is very good. After bishop h6, queen c3. So what should black try to do right now? This is very, very interesting. It's a very important position. We've already tied him down. He's already defending. I mean, this is a pretty big deal. When you got yourself, you know, like in a forced in attacking the position where you're making your opponent to lose his control by defending, this is a big deal for you. It's a very, really great idea. So how do we advance? What to do now? Let's think about it. Hmm. That's a great, great position, if you ask me. It's a very interesting one. Because, you know, um, one of the biggest things about this position is that we need to look for a tactic. We need to look for an attack, but it's not possible. There's no easy attack. There's no tactical resource here. So what do we do in this case? Anybody? Not e4. See, one of the things that I want to recommend you is if you get to check, the, there's a link beneath, beneath this video. It's, uh, it's called Comprehensive Beginner Chess Course, which offers an incredible amount of knowledge on how to play with, on, you know, how to attack when your opponent's under pressure. It's 27 hours, you know, of chess training explaining the secrets to middle game, control of the center, restricting the opponent and limiting him. Basically what it gives you is it gives you techniques. And so I'm going to talk about techniques just in a moment ago. And that's why I mentioned it right now. What, what a technique basically means is the possibility for you to know what certain things are most necessary so you can get your game to the next level. And it comes with a 60% off. So you can check it out. I'm going to send a link. But one of the things that's so important is making sure you always look at a way to coordinate your pieces. It was great. After that last move that we just do, it's uh, it's the move with which we're advancing against the E3. We have the rook ready, and we have the possibilities up up into play. And uh, okay, now actually after that 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 type of a move, now of course White is in trouble. He's got to play uh, rook b6, and then Black plays knight a4, <clears throat> and now we realize the big trouble. There is no way on where the queen is going to go. And, I mean, would I say to you, okay, here we go. This is amazing. Like, look at black. Black is attacking. Or look at white. White's losing. No. Because, true be told, this is a much more different position. But the biggest thing is that black becomes extremely successful. And he becomes incredibly successful with the way on how each and every one of his pieces really works out 
to attack White's position. This is the big deal. Attack White's position. And uh, so this is very important. And, uh, okay, after continuing with the move of, uh, so, <clears throat> uh, like, uh, actually, what you can find out is that in this position, uh, after we have the attack against the C3, we have the attack against the B6, and uh, now we have the, the threats. So after that variation, um, rook to bishop h6, queen to queen e7, knight e4, and um, so this is very important. Okay, after continuing with the move of uh, knight e4, uh, yeah, one well, white is going to play with the move, and, <clears throat> you know, just, uh, we, you know, wherever you go, we take the b6, we take e3, and uh, so this is very, very important. Okay. Big thing, you know, like, of course, the big thing uh, is always get the attack going, and just, this is really, really interesting this position. Always get the attack going. So now in case of queen to the b4, knight x to the b6, queen x to the b6, then there is bishop takes to the e3. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, in fact, after continuing with the move of from, you see, bishop takes, e, rook takes to the e3, queen takes the It's great. So now, obviously, white could not do it like that. Let me see what Pulagavsky did. In the game, after uh, 23, queen c3, queen e6, c7, um, he actually continued with the move of um, like white plays. Okay, what if white plays bishop to the e3, uh, bishop to f1? Mm -hmm. What do we do now? The first thing that uh, is out there in this position is, um, okay, we just attack. You know, like, it doesn't matter where white is going to go in this case. It's after we play with bishop takes to the e3. So, uh, you know, in this case, after bishop takes e3, white will play king to the h1. So, okay, this is very, very important. Uh, you know, we attack, we threaten. Then you know, actually, we continue with the move of. Uh, so uh, we have the we have the kind of a, a possibility. We can even think about a queen to the e4, and uh, <clears throat> so this is very important. All we need to do in this case is attack him. Then there's a bishop to the d4, queen e1, and white has rooks. Who cares? White has that rose rooks are there. It doesn't matter because most of his pieces are just completely backward. And after bishop to the d4, queen to the d2, we can have bishop e5. We can focus on that. Dark squares are bad. The white king is not so good. And also he's rook on the b4. It's perfect. So <clears throat> that is the big deal. The most valuable thing about this game is understand that development starts with setting up the right structure getting the pieces right and opening opening the lines and most importantly keeping the pressure over our opponent every single move we need more and more pressure so that's what we need to do i love that i think it was a great game by by uh, petrosian and it illustrated a few of the key techniques in the end game now i want to show you a game that was played by botvinnik himself now botvinnik was an incredible player uh he was an incredible positional player one of the greatest champions of all time. And he played this game versus Grandmaster Igor Bondarevsky. This was a, a, another very beautiful game. So let's take a look and see what this was all about. After e4, e6, d4, d5. Now white played e5 and c5. So then, of course, white plays knight f3, knight c6, bishop d3, and c6 to the d4. So essentially, white just lost a pawn, he castled, and there was bishop c5, a3, and knight g7. And this was a very good development out there. So like, okay, so after knight g e7, uh, so in fact, actually, that's very interesting. So what should black, what does black want to do right now? Okay, so what black wants to do is attack the pawn in the center with e5. And uh, see, next move, <coughs> 
Yeah, actually, we can see is a black is playing with the move of knight g6, queen c7, a5 maybe. It's when the center is so well protected, there's only one pawn, so uh, that we want to get get rid of. So seventh knight g7, knight bd2, knight g6, knight b3, and then bishop b6. So white plays rook e1 and bishop to the d7. So in this case, white plays g3. So what should black do right now? So what is black's best opportunity to follow? I want you to think and tell me your opinion about this position. It's a great position in the center. Strength and you know, power is available out there. Hmm. What's black's best way to go? I mean, the truth is that white's got a very strong pawn. He is not letting us off the hook with that pawn. That is for sure. So where do we go? Queen c7 attacking the pawn. I like that. I like that. <laughs> See, after 11 g3, black did not want to do it because even if you played with queen c7, white would probably go out with bishop takes g6 and then we wouldn't be achieving anything. You take the d4 and play bishop f4. So black realized that there is not a lot of, you know, pressure or a whole lot of activity out there with this. So we needed a different kind of move. What other move can we do now? Knight c7, knight c, there is another possibility for black, f6. This was the move that black wanted to do. Now you may be wondering, Valeri, why is that such a good move? Now did it, did it really have to happen? Does it really need to be played? Truth be told, no. It neither has to be happened nor it needs to be played. But the reason why it works so beautifully in this position is because black simply needs to get through an attack or challenge. This kind of move is the kind of move that is most necessary simply because as soon as it's played out, we have him on the backside. We have him defending. We have him, I mean, maybe even now our E5 pawn is going to get through and, and attack 3 4. That is something. See, the rule number one about these kind of positions always comes down to this Can you open up? Can you attack and, and sort of deliver the threats? If you can, there you go. That's all you need. If you can't, possibly you might need to do something else or different. With the F6 in mind, it was a great version of black attacking directly on the E5. And so now, with that move in mind, things really start to look a lot better. Let's see how they go. How did they go? F6. Then white plays bishop takes to the g6, h takes to the g6, and after h takes to the g, surely uh, there was the idea of queen g3 that white managed. <laughs> and it was a nice move. Why not? Let's just get the queen up to the d3, try to make the attack against the g g6 stand out as, as a power. And, uh, okay, so, like, I don't think this is anything bad for black. I mean, you can very quickly defend towards the towards that pawn on the g6 and make sure everything's fine, right? Well, that that sort of happens. I mean, after queen to the d3, next move by white, um, black played king f7. Now, the, the really interesting thing, and I want I'm going to talk to you about it right now because I think it's so important, is the danger. Now, let's put it this way: the most interesting part of any game. Is, whether, is to know whether you actually have enough firepower, control, like, or maybe not. And so 
I think that the, one of the easiest, to, the, you know, ways for you to say this is just by looking and then thinking about if threats can happen or they can by the opponent. Now, if you believe the opponent has the ability to create threats, sure. So right now, obviously, apparently, white doesn't have the ability to create threats. But then there's another interesting thing about this position, and you see that, you know, with that knight x to the d4, we can take, uh, you know, and, and capture e5 or create more challenges. So you see there that the, the possibility, in a way, for white to make any more threats. King of seven was just one of these little moves that needs to be done for the sake of keeping the position together. It is a great move, and honestly speaking, a perfect idea. Little, smart move in play for the attack. After the king took on the f7 square, uh, not, not only with the e5 attack and challenge, but also with everything else, you realize the, I mean, the danger that white has to endure. What did you do? Well, after king f7, in this case, white played h4. And this is the kind of attempt that he wants to do in order to reach out for our pawns and attack. So that's what he did. Let's just reach out and attack. It was a smart move, I got to say, by the way. It was a pretty smart move. But um, how to play now? We've stabilized the position on the king's side. We have a good center. We made sure that the opponent does not create any big threats at this point in time. That was great. That was really great. So where to go now? What to do now? Hmm. <laughs> it's an interesting question. Really, really interesting question. You know, I, as I get to think about this position, the first thing that comes to my mind is, really, there's got to be something big. I mean, why not? You know, the whole thing here is that there, there's got to be a real threat, a real, like, shot and a, and a challenge or something. And the biggest problem is that there just doesn't seem to be one. You know, it's you look at the situation and you say, all right, I don't know. I mean, I have no idea where this is going or where, what could really happen. <laughs> so you keep looking. And uh, I got to tell you, in 90% of the time, in 90% of the time. So what we really must do in this case. So like, in fact, is you consider do, coordinating your pieces. See, you know, in fact, actually, this is very, very important. And um, <clears throat> so, like, you want to get get going. You want to be able to realize and set up your pieces in a good direction. Queen g8 is exactly the move that black played out. Why? Because we need it. If you really think about it, it's always about that. What do we need? Let's connect the pieces. It's a crazy looking movie. If you say, Valeri, you're crazy now, I'll probably say, okay, you got a point. I may be a little crazy. But that's nevertheless the best move to be played in the position. Why? Because it fits very well. What we're doing in this moment is that we're actually setting up the queen to go directly at the h7. And so what we get to see too is that as it comes out to the h7 square, it's going to be plan preparing for a move like h4. We can have a, a chance to play alongside, uh, you know, h1. And it's a beautiful, beautiful move. The big concept, you know, in such kind of a situation is to realize how necessary it is to get the pieces to work together. With the queen in h7, we're able to do exactly that. <laughs> I mean... There's more to that, but this is the beginning. Queen g8, bishop d2, queen h7. Now g5 is on the line, and white plays bishop b4. It's kind of incredible how black plays this without being stuck.
stopped. Nobody could stop him. Can you imagine that? It's it's this is the real deal. There is no way on how Black could be stopped within his idea to break through, break down the palm, and reach reach out to attack. Why? Once again, we go back to the same old idea. Same old idea. What is the same old idea saying? The same old idea always says that the secret of success in these positions is the ability to have threats. If you lose that, you lose your opportunities. And if you lose your possibilities, it just it doesn't matter. Like there's not there's not a whole lot. There's not much to to do or challenge or threaten or you know whatever. See, this is the biggest problem. There is not much or a whole lot that one could do in this position. <laughs> so, in the end of the day, so to speak, um, there's a there's this big problem, and then there's of course the inability for uh, white to do anything. So he kind of loses this <laughs> more or less in a in a way. So let's see, pawn of the g5, then. There's queen takes h7, rook takes h7. Now, e takes f6, g takes f6, and h takes g. Now, I want you to think once again about black's best move here. Think about it. What's black's best move? Now, while you're thinking about the black's best move, once again, I want to advise you to take a look at the link below the video. It's 60% off for just a few hours of an incredibly comprehensive, almost, 30 hour course on positional play. It gives you all the secrets, all the important things that you need to know about positional chess and more. Take a look at that. I think it is not something you want to miss. In any case, we got a position in which basically black is supposed to deliver a way of you know moving forward, advancing in some way, and picking up on the right position. So how to advance here? You want to take a second and think about this carefully. What's Black's best way to go? I personally think that Black's got a great position with the H line. I think he's got more space and everything. Does anybody have an idea? Rook H8, not bad, not bad, not bad, not bad. I just don't think that it works. I don't think that it will be that important. What you want in such a position is make sure that you get more active pieces, yes. Besides that idea, even more important than that, than the more active pieces, it is the ability to control the center. Control the center. Hence, Black's best move in here was E5. And now you see what I'm talking about, don't you? This move isn't just a nice looking move in the center. It's Black's ability to push through. It's his way of showing, hey, I can attack you now. I can threaten you <laughs> before you know it. So that there is this E4 and uh, you see, just there's so much more to that. It's beautiful. Now, it's not, of course, without saying that white can defend or whatever, but e5 really seems to make a good deal out of itself. This is a great candidate. White plays g takes f, king takes f, bishop to the d6. And what should black do now? Let's see. Would any anybody give a suggestion? <coughs> Hmm. Hmm. Anyone? Try to exchange a dark screw bishop. I don't know. Maybe we e four. Maybe, maybe. We don't know. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. Think. What should Black do now? Take a moment. Think about this. Hmm. 
See, I honestly don't know about the E5 pawn because it looks like if we move it, it's going to create lots of different holes and weaknesses. But on the other hand, <clears throat> you know, there's... There's a there's other problems that we have to worry about too. So it's it's not that easy. It's not that simple. I want to put it this way: we can do e4, or we can do another candidate move. To my mind, the very best idea after White just played the move of bishop to the d6 is to finish what we don't have. Secret is always that if you bring more pieces right into the play you're going to be very successful because the amount of pieces that you can bring into the play is going to be terrific. And that is exactly what Black is doing in this position. He doesn't care about tactics, about attacks, about other stuff. He just wants to get as many pieces as possible into the play and then utilize these pieces in a perfect manner so that they can help each other and do well. I mean, that's it. This is really where it all goes and where it all holds on to. You don't need special tactics. All you need is just the knowledge of, okay, this is how it's supposed to be. That's how I'm supposed to be thinking and, and bringing my pieces and closing in to the opponent. And that's beautiful, by the way. Great move. The whole principle always stands to be this thing. How do I get more pieces closer in line? And I found out that oftentimes the best moves in chess are, are found out when you look at your worst place pieces and you get them in better positions. Many people wouldn't agree with that. I'm fine with that. And I, again, over, again, time over time, I have found out that it's just, if you find out your worst place piece, if you find out the pieces that you really don't like or you want to have in the battle and you bring them, you're halfway there. This is a winning strategy. Black is not intending to keep the rook over there, but he brought it in when it was necessary. And now he finds a way, he finds a way to bring one more piece that's very necessary. Does anybody have a suggestion? What other piece do we need to bring into the play? What is it? What does Black need to bring into the play? <laughs> so what other pieces does black really need to bring into the battle so that they can have the value as well as the, the strength to attack him See, I honestly believe that a lot of the black pieces are feeling incredibly terrible on the back side <laughs> because, you know, we got the rook from the G8 and we got the rook on H8. Um, but then when you think about a piece like the light square bishop, it's not too good. It's really not that great. But then the moment we bring it into play, now it becomes incredible. We have the C2 shot. We have the threat. We got the opening of the position that happens off the D3. And we've got it all row working. It's perfect. Rook D2, pawn takes the C2. Then obviously white's got a problem. <laughs> See, this is how it's supposed to be done. Challenges, threats, delivery. Every single move delivers a significant problem versus White's position. And we get to see uh, why that's so good. I mean, so in fact, after continuing with the move of uh, pawn to the C2, if it, when White played with a move F4 in this position, <coughs> now, apparently White is not being in a great game. He's having a lot to worry. <coughs> Here, G4, so F4, Bishop B3, takes, takes, takes. And King E7. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, now what? 
what we realize is that these two bishops together with the two pawns are simply amazing. And it's really, there's nothing that white can do in this position because, um, you know, there's the d4, there's the bishop to the d3, there's c1, and white is obviously losing it. What I find amazing about this game is how the absence of threats was the one thing that failed black, white at all times. He had a good position, had the weaknesses, but because there was no energy, he was never able to create any threats. And that's a powerful thing to realize, that the threats are everything that we need. If threats are missing, the tactics are also missing, and they would not work. So I think Black did really well with this whole game. He found out a way to challenge and keep the pressure over white. He created it in a beautiful, great manner. So I do hope that you enjoyed this game as much as I did. I think it was uh, really fascinating, at least in my own in my own opinion. So uh, yeah, that's that's basically all I wanted to sort of point out and say as a as a major major game. So once again, um, I, w I wanted to I want to apologize for my voice. I uh, think that it will be fair. It will be much better before next time. But please bear with me. I'm going to be having my next lecture on Saturday again, next Saturday at the usual time. So stay tuned for another very instructive topic that I'll try to, to cover. And in the meantime, if uh, any of you guys want to uh, give me any uh, suggestions or qu you have some questions or whatever, I'll be more than happy to um, provide you with my own feedback and recommendations. Thank you so very much. And don't forget to check the link below beneath this video. There's a great link with 60% discount on one of the most instructive uh, like packages for training. Check it out. I think you're going to have a, a ton of fun. Right in. Thank you.